The Prime Minister says the Liberal Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador is bowing to political pressure to oppose the April 1st carbon tax hike. I think Mr. Fury is continuing to bow to political pressure. Uh, I think Canadians in Newfoundland and Labrador and right across the country expect their governments to do the right thing. It's basic math and we're going to continue to be there to support Canadians with the Canada carbon rebate. Well, an unbowed Premier Fury's office pushed back with a statement saying Premier Fury has always been clear that the federal carbon tax is not the appropriate instrument to mitigate climate change at this time. That's where we're going to start with the Friday Power Panel. Negan Sinclair is a columnist for the Winnipeg Free Press. Jason Marcus office with the CBC, and he's in Calgary. And here with me in the studio, the Toronto Star Ottawa Bureau Chief, Tonda McCharles, and editorial writer for Le Devoir, Marie Vastel. Okay, Tonda, I want to start with you, but first, I want to show everybody this clip. The Prime Minister gave an interview to our Radio Canada colleagues, and it was interesting because he says he thinks about leaving his job every day. Watch this. Moi, je chose à quitter à tous les jours. C'est une job de, de fou que je suis en train de faire. Les sacrifices au niveau personnel. Tu sais, si je, je doutais pas à, à quasiment à tous les jours de ce que je fais, euh, je serais pas humain. Bien sûr, c'est super tough, c'est super plate des fois. Mais mon Dieu, la piste sur laquelle on est est tellement précaire. Les démocraties sont tellement sous attaque, à, sous attaque à travers le monde avec du populisme extrême, avec, avec des, 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 des attaques internationales. D'être là pour ce combat, c'est pour ça que je, je suis rentré en politique. Pas pour être populaire, pas pour, pas pour des, des raisons personnelles, parce que je veux servir et je sais que j'ai quelque chose à offrir. Okay, uh, Tana, perhaps a bit of a revealing answer there, but it, it, it's interesting that the, the, what he said today about Andrew Fury, because he's not just like the only liberal provincial premier. This is Fury mm -hmm. co chaired or chaired Trudeau's leadership campaign in 2015 yeah, in, in that province. Maybe. I don't know where it stands after today. Well, maybe not what today. are your thoughts maybe, on this? Maybe yeah. today they're not going yeah. out for a beer. But uh, I, I found it a super interesting tension in this week's politics. You yeah. expect that the Conservative premiers across the country, which have in the past been described as, you know, the real opposition, um, you expect them to oppose the next carbon tax increase. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, but to have Andrew Fury weigh in at this time was really uh, speaking, I think, to the political momentum that's grown uh, against the increase. Uh, and at a time when the Liberal government itself, Trudeau's own cabinet, has established that there's an affordability issue mm -hmm. with the carbon pricing scheme. They have dropped it for people in Newfoundland and Labrador and all through the Atlantic and elsewhere in rural areas on home heating fuels. So they've oil. already... Only on oil. Only on oil. Yes, not on and natural so, gas. And so they've so they've already sort of given ground. So I think uh, it is it is actually fair to say that that's kind of chipped away at their own armor, right? And yeah. and and Andrew Fury is in a province where many people uh, not only have the cost of home heating oil, but you know it's not a high income province, and so uh, this is biting them. And so it's a really interesting tension in the federation. Nigan uh, Fury has made this request before, but never with the. Federal Liberals 20 points behind in polls, you know, and, and the sort of the situation they're in. I, I just wonder, you know, Wab Kanu is the one Premier who we haven't seen write a letter or make a demand this week. Uh, David Eby's sticking with, uh, you know, carbon pricing, so is Francois Legault, but everyone else. Uh, w where's Kanu going to go on this, and, and how, how do you think that might play? Uh, Canoe's in sort of a, a mini battle over here over the issue of the landfill search, uh, but has already spent a lot of political capital talking about the 14 cent gas tax uh, exemption that he held off at the beginning of the year uh, for the province. And so uh, that's really where he's put a lot of that energy in. And I also don't see uh, he's still sort of gaining all of the political momentum from the billion dollar health care deal that he made with Trudeau just a month ago. So uh, I was going to bring that up as kind of a way in which we can see Trudeau maybe like gaining, you know, how just a few weeks ago, we saw all of these provinces make signing healthcare deals with Trudeau. Uh, and now just a few weeks later with this carbon tax increase, all that goodwill has kind of dissipated. And so the question is, is really how will, how can they, the federal liberals gain any sort of momentum uh, or any sort of way of addressing this? And I think it really goes back to looking at what the ways in which the provinces can have some conversations on federally on these issues, because the amount of cacophony of alliances that are in most of the country, even in liberal corners around uh, this opposition to this increase is really going to, in Doug 
forcing, annihilate, uh, annihilate, sorry, uh, the federal liberals. Okay, so it, it's not just premiers, uh, and Trudeau's not the only federal leader talking about carbon taxes. I, I want to show you a letter that Pierre Polyev wrote to the Premier of British Columbia, David Eby, asking Eby not to administer the April 1st tax hike that would keep BC's provincial carbon tax in line with the federal backstop and to join his provincial colleagues in calling on the feds uh, to stop the hike. And I want to show you, David Eby was asked about this uh, late this afternoon. Here's what David Eby had to say about Pierre Polyev's request for him not to raise the BC carbon price. I don't live in the Pierre Polyev campaign office and baloney factory. Uh, I live in British Columbia. I'm the premier. Decisions have consequences. And I know that Mr. Polyev knows that his suggestion would leave less money for British Columbians. But that's not his priority. Fair enough. Uh, so, Jason, I, I don't think I've ever seen a premier use the phrase baloney factory before, uh, but that's a no. I, I'm going to translate that. Um, and, and also, what do you make of a Pierre Polyev writing a letter to a premier telling a premier what they should do in their jurisdiction? It's an interesting little side development in this today. Is it a West Coastism? I'm not, uh, I, I'm not sure. It does, on this side of the Rockies, we do not, uh, at least I don't use that phrase. Maybe, maybe it's an EBism. I, uh, I, I do not have a specific insight into that one. Um, but look, he, uh, Mr. Polyev, uh, was uh, making the same case when he was on a recent uh, speaking uh, trip to uh, Vancouver, actually ex explore, ex t telling uh, businesses they should be lobbying the government to drop the carbon tax because it costs on them. I mean, of course, BC has been in, uh, you know, has lived with a carbon tax. Uh, part, past governments have won elections. So both, uh, you know, the Liberals in uh, BC, which are not the same as the federal Liberals, of course, and uh, the NDP have successively uh, won elections and fought on uh, on a robust carbon tax for British Columbia well before um, well before a candidate. That said, this, you know, Trudeau has also won, uh, you know, three elections on a carbon tax, but the tide seems to have turned. I don't know how unpopular this might be in uh, BC, but certainly it seems like it has uh, ratcheted up, uh, you know, op opposition to it in every other province, including in the Atlantic provinces, where, as Tonda rightly points out, mm. uh, Trudeau must be thinking, we, we gave you guys something. Why? <laughs> Why still? Why still? <laughs> Why um, you, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, the, the premiers and uh, the conservative leader who had little limited success uh, before the affordability crisis have now had success and they've uh, you know they've been able to associate in so many Canadians minds that this is the you know the the the, the end all and be all of uh, the affordability pressures um, they talk about this as though there is not a world in which there is a carbon uh, <coughs> rebate the uh, and what's interesting now with both EB's comment and uh, Trudeau's defense is that they seem not to talk about the climate change effects of it. They talk about yeah. almost primarily, not, not primarily, but uh, heavily now about, oh, you're going to be taking money out of people's, people's uh, pockets if you don't let us raise the tax, um, which is a difficult, tricky message to... Uh, to show, especially when you're, uh, you know, on days where people don't have the check in hand, but they are nest per, per, probably uh, paying for gas or uh, paying a home heating bill. Yes, it, it, Maria, it puts them in a perverse spot of, of arguing that if you don't let us tax you more, you're going to have less money in your pocket. But yeah. that's kind of how the rebate works for the vast majority of Canadians, and that's their financial argument. And, and the emissions reductions show that broadly. The policy is is working. It's not yeah. quite at the target they wanted to be, but as as Tonda said off the top, the tension in the politics this week is at a whole different level. It seems. Yeah, and if I can go a little bit geeky, <coughs> if you'll allow me. It's a political um, show on the CBC, <laughs> so go right ahead. What I find really interesting, and we've we've been seeing it, um, you know, kind of. Um, come to a boil over the past few months, but we now have seven. We now have seven out of eight provinces who are arguing that because of cost of living, mm -hmm. we need to stop this hike of the carbon price, which is essentially three cents a liter starting next month. Um, and it, it, you've really seen this sort of shift in public opinion, but also public policy, where cost of living has now. Um, overcome the importance of climate change and environmental policy. And yes. even in Quebec, you mentioned we have our own carbon... Um, cap and trade. Yes, thank you, system. cap and trade. Yep. I always forget how to say it in English. Uh, but even Quebec, which is one of the greenest provinces, I would argue, mm -hmm. seen as, uh, in this week's budget, François Legault announced that they are cutting the rebate for buying um, electric vehicles um, in a broader attempt to kind of... Um, restrain the budget and, and deal with the deficit. So even in Quebec, we're sort of seeing certain measures being drawn back. And, it, you know, we're six years away from the 2030 targets, which we're not 
hitting um, right now. GHGs are going up after the pandemic, they're going back up. Temperatures are hitting records. Um, and there does seem to be, we do seem to be at a time where we're starting to need to find a better balance between cost of, li of living, yes, for sure, um, but also transition and, 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 and addressing the climate crisis and climate change. Because I don't think one can replace the other. You can't just take care of climate change, of course, but you also can't just take care of, of, of the cost of living and completely abandon your targets because you also need to have a vision for the future when you're in government. But, but you know, Tonda, on that, right, like the, the all the economic analysis you read that's not political, carbon pricing is such a tiny, 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 tiny portion of any of the cost of living stuff. Like food prices are up everywhere because it's global factors that come into it and places without carbon and pricing biggest, have the same challenges. And the thing that's eating the most into people's household budgets is their rental and mortgage mm -hmm. costs. Yeah, and that's not and, carbon. And that is yeah. not carbon. And that is putting, I think, the political pressure not just rental, shelter, housing costs, but grocery costs, right? So that is bringing to bear all the pressure on all the politicians. Nobody actually, I, I don't hear anyone actually making a, a, a good argument to say, and it might be arguable, to say, why not put a pause on the increase and then when inflation comes down and interest rates come down, at that point that increase kicks in mm -hmm. at a certain threshold, which would be the middle ground between mm -hmm. all sides Which is what here. Fury and King is saying it. that. Yeah. Nobody's actually saying that. Well, I, I, going out and making that argument. But or to your point, address housing, address grocery bills, yeah. but don't, right. don't, don't go after a carbon tax. That really doesn't have that big a, uh, of an impact on, on people's day-to-day -day bill. I'm not saying it doesn't have an impact, but not the biggest. No, no, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not mortgage gas. renewal, which yeah. is the big thing. But, you know, Nigan, I, I, I had Chris Reagan on the show last night, who was uh, with the Ecofiscal Commission. He's now with the Maxwell School of Public Policy at McGill University, and he was one of the people who had input on the climate plan. He makes the point that you shouldn't pause, even pause carbon pricing, because it kills the momentum. It sends a signal of uncertainty. People don't know where it's going to go long term. And if you want to deal with a affordability, increase the rebates for a year if you have to. Find other ways to put money in people's pockets, which Tiff Macklem may not like, but you know, it's a way to preserve the integrity of your carbon pricing system. Um, where do you see this going in, in terms of, the, you know, a lot of the provinces who are opposing this tried to stop it at the Supreme Court level and at the ballot box and it failed, but it seems like inflation and cost of living has given them their path uh, to try to un unspool this policy. Yeah. Uh, Justin Trudeau's been very clear in that all the chips in there are in the middle on this one. And they're, if they do, you know, it's a, it's a matter of if you give an inch, it looks like a mile. And when you turn back or pause, it will really be looked at as a supreme victory for Polyev and for mm -hmm. all of the different right-wing conservative premiers that are uh, time and time again taking up the headlines and the news shows, taking up the most amount of footprint on this issue. And that Trudeau's set coming out today and talking a little bit about how tired he is and talking about as a federal leader, whether he's considering uh, what his future is, is a sign, I think, of uh, that kind of doubling down over and over and over again, wearing on him. Because what it leads to is it leads to a real question of whether potentially the federal election is something that's in his sights in the future. Because he staked so much on this carbon tax and so much on carbon pricing that he can't turn it back now. Because he's really got very few allies left and there's blood in the water on this issue and that everybody goes after him. Uh, we'll see whether his hubris, his hubris, which is the kind of confidence that led him up to this point, is something that can carry him forward on this issue. Because if he takes a step back, it's almost as if that's the real big tipping point within his government. But, you, you know, Jason, I, I look at his comments uh, today and he's like, yeah, of course I think about quitting. Stop asking me about it because, you know, the job is hard. But then he laid out all the reasons why he feels uh, the, the, the need to stay. The challenge on this policy issue for him is uh, there's going to be a couple of votes on this uh, in the House of Commons next week. And we know Ken McDonald has voted against this in the past. If more, I don't know, if more than Ken vote against it, is it a big? Is it a ten? Is it a big deal for the for the liberals if that happens? I mean, what what are they potentially facing next week when Polyev tries to jam them on uh, on motions and legislation? You know, I mean, he he tried to give a more spirited defense of his policy uh, mm. this week than he has before, stressing that you know we we'd have to do more regulation. I know this isn't popular. Um, really stressing the carbon rebate. Uh, so he he's trying. I mean, it you know the. 
you know, there's been one direction in which the momentum has been going on this, and it's not been towards uh, towards Trudeau. So I'm not sure if uh, next week's opportunities uh, will reverse that. I don't know if they'll worsen either. I haven't heard anything, um, but I do have to wonder, and I do I do want to know from Liberals about this. So Trudeau was saying today that uh, that uh, Mr. Fury was uh, succumbing to political pressure. What were they doing last fall when they uh, lifted the ho the uh, carbon tax on home heating oil in that case? <laughs> I, I think they were bowing to political pressure, Jason. I, I don't know. That, that seems like that would be the answer to me. It's certainly why you heard from Atlantic MPs. Uh, you know, Tanya, just as a final point, I mean, I, I don't know if um, the retail carbon price is going to survive. Uh, it, it just seems like that's where the politics of this is going. And when this many premiers come out, and depending on where the next election goes, we, Pierre Polyev was asked about this today. I know you're going to get rid of this. Do you get rid of uh, industrial carbon industrial pricing, pricing if you win? And there wasn't even a we clear answer, answer on that. Like, we have no clear sense. We know what Trudeau is going to do. We have no clear sense what the Conservatives Look, I think do, if right? the Conservatives win, there's no question yeah. that mm -hmm. consumer carbon price goes, mm -hmm. uh, as does the whole rebate program. Everything goes uh, in that on the consumer end. The industrial emitters end is a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. But I think it's also maybe... I think premature to think that Trudeau's going to bow to the yeah. conservative yeah. pressure on this. Agree. He's got mm -hmm. too much at yeah. stake. Oh, yeah, it is a sure. centerpiece yeah. of his yeah. governing agenda Politics for the last eight years. Yeah. So. yeah. And and there's always a balancing act for the Liberals on many topics we've talked about on the show, but also on this. Progressive voters voted for him in 2015, partly um, for cannabis, but also um, <laughs> for a carbon pricing mechanism and yeah. action on climate. That's one of the reasons they voted for him. So. Yes, there's conservatives uh, criticizing it and asking for mm. it to end, but there's also people on the progressive side that he needs to keep from the NDP if he's, mm. he's not going to get annihilated, like Mr. Ford likes to tell us for the past week. Um, so he can't completely shift. And there's also, you know, the liberals have said the carve-out for oil heating will be the only carve-out. Mr. Guilbeault, Minister of Environment, has pretty much telegraphed that if there is another carve-out, he's out. And yeah. you know what, Mr. Guilbeault, not popular in the rest of Canada, very popular in Quebec. You know where the Liberals are the last province to actually be competitive? <laughs> yeah, I know. In Quebec. So there's there's also that, that they can't completely just, you know, turn their back on that legacy policy, like Tonda says, um, and, 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 and just get rid of the carbon tax. On, on If I could quickly, on yeah, quick. Mr. Trudeau's interview with um, Alec Castonguay on your French radio program, um, he, he actually hinted to the same thing in... Uh, interviews before Christmas saying, yeah, yeah, I think about it every day. Um, I don't I don't necessarily think that his reflection every day is policy oriented or personally oriented um, because the prime minister was on a, a, another French flagship show on Sundays mm -hmm. on French TV, which is like two million viewers, tout le monde, viewers, yeah. tout le monde yeah. it's a big thing in, in yeah. my home province, um, where he was asked about his family situation and he got quite emotional, did, you know, yeah. saying... Um, Yes, you know, it's been hard and blah, blah, blah. My family's doing okay now. But saying politics is more important, essentially. And to what sort of he said at lunch today in that interview as well, to him there seems to be a very clear direction for the country, which in his opinion, his is the best. Um, it, it does seem to be personal for him in terms of direction of the, the country, but also um, maybe his doubts were a little bit more I had a hard time personally this year, mm. and yeah, I, I didn't enjoy it all the time, but he's made the decision to stay on. No, oh, politics is, is a tough life, man. Yep. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it uh, for anybody. <laughs> I haven't covered it for, uh, for most of my professional life. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit because Ontario Premier Doug Ford wants more funding and approvals for roads in the upcoming federal budget, particularly when it comes to the proposed Highway 413 project that's been held up by a federal environmental assessment. And Ford made the request in a letter to the Prime Minister, everyone sending him letters, <laughs> noting where federal jurisdiction applies, Ontario expects the federal government to ensure its legislation and regulations help build new roads, highways, and public transit projects faster, instead of slowing down Ontario's ability to build these much needed projects. Okay, that's what Ontario's watching for. What should Canadians be watching for? Um, Jason, it seems like every time a premier writes the prime minister a letter, they want the pre prime minister to stop doing his job and get out of the way so they can do their job faster. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this move by Ontario? Uh, what kind of a position do you think they're, they're trying to put uh, Trudeau and Christopher Freeland in, in the run-up to the budget? I mean, if the carve-outs and, um, you know, the, the government on the ropes, uh, people want to leverage what they can. And I think every you know, every premier, um, with exceptions I'm not sure of, uh, might think they have some leverage over him. That if you want to be popular in our province, you should do what what, uh, what the <laughs> provincial people need. Um, so the you know, 413, uh, you know, for 
for um, for Doug Ford's base is a uh, huge issue. It's very intriguing to see that he's really pushing not only on the funding for that, uh, especially in the context of what uh, Guy Hubeau said about uh, not wanting to provide federal funding for major infrastructure projects uh, that would be roads, um, but also his uh, his talk about the Impact Assessment Act. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. Of course, big thing. We talk about a lot in out out, uh, out west, the Bill C-69, but actually, if you really strip things back, that's one of the big sticky points on it. This that big bill that's going to uh, require federal environmental Environmental um, assessments on major infrastructure projects that are not necessarily yeah. uh, federal um, that could really that could really impact that project. Um, it's you know, and that's sort of thing that uh, that the federal that the uh, Supreme Court suggested that that's not the sort of project that should necessarily be uh, subject to the appeal or assessment. As a, from a federal level, um, so that's a really interesting uh, point that he's pushing, and um, I'm not sure how uh, much leverage the, uh, the Wilkinson, the Natural Resources Minister, or or Gibbo would have on that one. Nagan, are you looking to jump in there? I, 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 what are, what are your uh, yeah, thoughts? I mean, Ford's call is for more roads uh, to re major resource projects like the Ring of Fire. More mm -hmm. roads mean, means more investment. Uh, more investment means more engagement, more political pressure. And what Ford is really looking for there is he's looking for uh, the kind of economic juggernaut or the economic growth of some projects that will really help him. And he's trying to appeal to, to Trudeau on the on that particular issue of the Ring of Fire per se. But if you know if you go to the Ring of Fire and you look at that project. Um, it really goes against the things we just spoke about in the last segment because uh, the largest store of carbon is in the Ring of Fire in the peatlands, marshlands. And so it's really kind of a contradictory way in which uh, if Ford gets the success of building roads, calling for those roads with his political ally, Trudeau, in trying to say, hey, if you want support in Ontario, it will actually go against many of the things that Trudeau is trying to get in the carbon pricing. So it's kind of a political hot potato to be able to uh, appeal on certain issues with Trudeau in which that he knows that will mm. bite him in the back. Tant, uh, what's your sense on this? Well, I, I would just put all of Ford's asks in that letter in the context of a huge pre-budget demand. Give, give me money, give me help, get out of my way to build some yeah, things I want yeah. to build. But the federal government has already said that... Um, when it comes to the Ring of Fire, in fact, there are projects critical to the critical mineral strategy yeah. and the EV supply chain, battery the stuff supply they're working chain. On together. Yeah. They say that there's, there are more accessible, closer to factory adjacent projects further south in Ontario that are closer to completion. And so while both Mr. Ford and Mr. Trudeau's governments have talked about development in the Ring of Fire up nor in northern Toronto, for those who, who don't know what it is, um, where there are a lot of critical minerals, um, it's a long ways off. It's, an, it's, it's a, a, a scheme that should probably be seen in the context of a 20 or 30 year timeline. Right. There are not Indigenous communities who've given their consent to that kind of development. It's exactly. a massive project. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, ju and just coming back to Ford's um, you know, demand about the big highway he wants to build. He's already been lobbying the government since last year when they built the Stellantis, they went together on the Stellantis project and the other, the VW projects and all of that. He's been saying to the feds, leave us alone on 413, stop opposing it, let me, and there, he's got sympathetic voices around, or listeners, I guess, an audience around the cabinet table on that. There's, I would say, it suggests there's yeah. some tensions in cabinet about it. Uh, a lot of the liberal MPs in the GTA kind of may not want to be too oppositional to it, but uh, others take the environmental view. We don't need roads, we should be building public transit. So I have, though, a sense that the government isn't going to unnecessarily jam that. In or, or around the budget, they are going to roll out the new changes or their response to the court's ruling on the Impact Assessment Act. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I thought we'll I saw see some, that soon. I thought I saw reporting in your opinion paper by Benzi on this, that maybe Dominic Leban had given them an assurance on this, right? Am I, am I correct on that? Was that, that you, spring. both of you together? Yes, yeah, we yeah, reported yeah. that last spring, that yeah. Dominic Leblanc had given them some assurance that the feds will stay yeah. out of the way on it. But that has not uh, emerged, you know, right, in a policy exactly. statement yeah. of any kind. So... Yeah. And I apologize if I took your byline off that story. I just remember mm -hmm. <laughs> I talking. I, I remember America. talking about it with Benzi when it came yeah. out. That, that's that's why it yeah. sticks with me. So Marie, we, we had this uh, a series of demands from from Premier Ford, yep. which you know help us build a road goes against what Stephen Gilbo said. Uh, you know at that conference recently, and you talked about how you know uh, Quebec is where they're popular relatively speaking yeah. to the rest of the country. Ontario is where they win the seats. Yep. That's where the yeah, majority yeah, yeah. is delivered. Right. So now 
he said no to Legault today on immigration. Can he say no to Ford? And what are the implications of saying no to Legault on immigration, do you think? He said no to Legault on full powers on immigration. Yes. Which I'm pretty sure François Legault just asked because they always ask, because they have not? to ask. <laughs> sure. But I don't think that Mr. <laughs> Legault office really expected them to <laughs> yeah. say, sure, let's change the yeah. Constitution on yeah. the corner of the table on a Friday lunch. Um, well, they, they'd, they'd be happy actually, if he said yes. Yes, but, yeah. but I don't think they really you know, had their hopes that high. Um, but there were actually some movement uh, in, on immigration uh, where Mr. Trudeau seemed to be open to, um, I guess, reviewing temporary immigration, a recognition that perhaps it's gone too high and provinces need help to manage the arrival. Mm -hmm. There is also apparently a lot of movement on health because Quebec is the last province not to have signed that bilateral deal with um, Ottawa on, on, on health transfers. And so I did sense a change of tone from the prime minister today with Quebec. And I'm wondering if he um, might want to have the same one with Doug Ford for the reasons you've exposed. It seems like perhaps um, the prime minister has gone a little far, at least from a Quebec perspective, in terms of um, interfering in provinces and telling them you should have this national program, you should have this national program. Um, and perhaps now that polls aren't so good and mm -hmm. mandate seems to be coming to an end, they're kind of recognizing <laughs> maybe, in, they in both scale directions. It, yeah, maybe they should scale it back a little yeah. bit and kind of try and work collaboratively with, with, at a minimum, the provinces that they think that they need um, electorally. And on an opposite note, I'm sort of going back to what we were saying earlier, but I was surprised to see Pierre Poirier send that letter, letter to David Eby on carbon pricing because totally on brand about carbon pricing, not so much on brand about conservatives traditionally being very much more hands off with provinces right. than the liberals. Well, he has used jurisdiction in news conferences to avoid answering questions yes. on topics he doesn't want to talk yes. about. Uh, even though his policies on housing in, involve barging into yep. municipal and provincial jurisdiction. And today yep. he flat out wrote a letter yep. to a first minister and said, don't do what you are legally sure elected to do. Not sure it's the smartest long-term strategy. Yes, it's, it's, it's something to, to remember for sure. Uh, so look, Jason, uh, you, you know, Ford is writing this letter uh, uh, to lay out his expectations for the budget. We're about a month away from the April 16th budget uh, from Christian Freeland. My understanding is there's going to be a more aggressive uh, communications plan from mm -hmm. this government on it this time because uh, their budgets have not had many legs uh, or tails in the past, that we're going to see a bunch of things from the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister in the weeks leading up to the budget, and then more stuff after with ministers fanning out. Um, how critical is this for them to actually like communicate clearly what they're trying to do and, and find a way to make it stick and resonate with voters, given everything else that they're stacked up against? Well, it, it, you know, when you're down 20 points in the polls or so, um, every single point seems like a must, you know, must gain ground point because they need to gain a lot of ground and they're running out of major inflection points to it. I mean, there's no major inflection point uh, than the budget. So, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of advocates saying, you guys got to promote yourselves more, tell your, do a better job of telling your story. Some people will just say you should end that sentence shorter and just say, do a better job, of course. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, you know, they know the pressure's on. They know that this is an opportunity to, to tell a new story, to do new things. I mean, are they going to uh, fulfill every, every uh, premier's wish? No. And that's one thing that it's worth underlining when regard, with regards to uh, specifically um, uh, Mr. Ford's letter. Um, this is perennial stuff, right? Every yeah. time there's a budget, uh, you'll get a big wish list from uh, different premiers. Um, Danielle Smith, when she met with uh, the Alberta Premier, when she met with the, the Prime Minister uh, in Calgary earlier this week, had various wishes, including more support for um, carbon capture projects by major oil sands companies. Um, you know, will she get all that? No. Does she probably, you know, hope that she'll get something um, if, if she's going to uh, go public with it so she can project some of her own small level of victory as well? Yeah. So, I mean, these are going to be things that they'll either put out there because they know they can get a, vi a small victory and, you know, paraded around to their, uh, their constituents, or they make a big point, like uh, Danielle Smith saying, hey, Mr. Trudeau, you should fire your environment minister. Yes, no? that's okay. her big budget demand, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know if she's going to get that necessarily. But, you know, Nigan, uh, uh, Jason talks about this being an inflection point, and, and that's kind of what the Liberals are, are looking for right now with the runway they have left, right? So, and there's not that many of them. There's two budgets left, if, if the calendar holds two carbon tax hikes, if, the, if, the, if that policy holds. We don't know how many Bank of Canada interest rate decisions and potentially cuts there might be, and there is the U.S. presidential election. But those are the only sort of known inflection points I think you can look at. I mean, there'd be various provincial elections which could tell us some things, but they've got to uh, have a budget that responds to the moment and, and gives them a bit of a narrative to tell because they're not in a great narrative situation at the moment. It's just everyone's mad at them. Uh, well, don't downplay the uh, interest rates oh, not. Uh, potential mm. coming down. And, and then on top of that, the, uh, 
the fact that you know major projects that that the Trudeau Liberals have been invested in for a long period of time, Trans, Trans Mountain starts to flow in just a few months from now. It's undergoing testing right now. Even Daniel Smith talked about that and talked about that as in kind of a rare moment of applause for the Trudeau government, and then suggested that there would be all these other Indigenous economic development opportunities. I mean, there is some potential there for some smaller wins, uh, particularly in areas that they have not won or had sort of universal losses over the past few months. Uh, the reality is that the Trudeau Liberals really have uh, to play on the issues that they have been the most successful on, and that have been on some of the investment issues that I spoke about earlier about the healthcare deals, um, issues around pharmacare, around dental care, and for them to be able to build on some of those issues at the same time of kind of wait it out for the economic good news, which will happen later this year, uh, and for people to pay attention to the fact that unemployment and the economy aren't doing all that bad, and the ways in which they can sort of spin that message to the ways in which the Conservatives haven't been specific on their messaging involving either environmental issues yeah. or the issues of trying to deal with uh, the economic policies that they want to bring forward. Yeah, Tanda, it seems Canada has kind of hit the soft landing on the avoiding the recession, you know, uh, technically, that's what it looks like, and a better recovery than, than a lot of the comparator nations. But uh, it, it's still... There are other challenges in the country, and the stakes of this budget are, are pretty high. The stakes are high. The other big challenge, and, you know, we spoke to Ontario's finance minister this week, and he said the thing is, even though technically the numbers are not terrible, we're not in that, you know, the recession that was feared, it feels like a recession to mm. a lot of people. And that's the political challenge for this government going into this budget, right? It's mm. not just that maybe they need to wait it out and they can perhaps, you know, put out over the time frame measures that will get them there to wait till the interest rates drop someone. But right now, for the immediate sort of several months, people are still facing mortgage renewals at high rates. Yeah. And That's the big those one for things, them. It's, right? it's a number of people, like yeah. a lot of those people that Marie talked about who voted for legalized marijuana, they're now trying to buy homes, right? Or are buying <laughs> homes. And, and, and they're in that stage of life where it's becoming tough to do those yeah. things. Just final thoughts from you for a goodbye. Yeah, yeah. But also even older, not that only young people smoke cannabis, but anyway, we won't get into that. Um, but even <laughs> That's older a whole other people, panel. <laughs> <laughs> so I, don't know. I always get in trouble when I talk about this on the show. Um, but even older Canadians are having to um, foreclose their homes. Like yeah. even people who own homes can't afford them anymore because it's hiked $800, $1,000 a month. So Tonda is right. I think it's one thing to say, yeah, but the numbers aren't that bad. But when people feel it when they do their groceries and it's twice what it used to be or when they, yeah. they're thinking, am I going to have to get rid of my house? Um, that's a really hard messaging to convince people when mm -hmm. in their day to day it's very, very concrete. And and I, I haven't heard it from the government so far. Maybe they'll figure it out by yeah. next month, but... Macro numbers are one thing. Micro numbers are yeah. what people pay attention to on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. and that's where they've got to connect uh, uh, on budget day, at least in, in terms of empathy yeah. and, and response. Okay, gang, that was fun. Uh, I want to say goodbye. Have a good weekend. Thank you to the Friday Power Panel. Uh, Jason Markasoff, Miguel Sinclair, Tonda McCharles, and Marie Vastel. Thanks so much, gang.